Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Monty Hart Lecture Series. It's a, a great pleasure to have today Dr. Greg Panaro, who will be speaking about rapid and intensive guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure. Dr. Fonaro is a professor of cardiovascular medicine and science at UCLA. He serves as the chief of the UCLA Division of Cardiology and director of the Anmanson UCLA Cardiomyopathy Center and co-director of the UCLA's Preventive Cardiology Program. His research interests center on acute and chronic heart failure, preventive cardiology, quality of care outcomes, and implementing treatment systems to improve clinical outcomes. Dr. Fonaro is very well published. He has over 1,400 research studies and clinical trials published each year from 2014 to 2022. Dr. Fonaro has been selected by the Clarivariate uh, website for the list of highly cited researchers, which it identifies the world's most influential contemporary researchers across 21 scientific fields. So this is a big accomplishment. Dr. Forno has received numerous awards, including the Clinical Research Forum Distinguished Clinical Achievement Award in 2015, AHA National Chairman Award 2017, the Outstanding Lifetime Achievement Award from the AHA Quality of Care and Outcomes Research in 2019. And in 2020, Dr. Forno was also uh, selected to become a member of the Association of University Cardiologists, which is an organization that was founded in, in 1961 and it's only limited to an active membership of 135 academic cardiologists who shape the research and training in cardiovascular disease in the US. So it's a great honor to have you here. We know we're very lucky to have you talking about this very important topic. So thank you very much. Great, thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation to present on this topic. I'm very passionate about rapid and intensive guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure. Please note my disclosures. So this slide really highlights for us how common, costly, and by natural history, deadly heart failure is in the United States. 6.7 million men and women with heart failure. There'll be over a million new cases, incident heart failure this year. Mortality rates remain high, 415,000 deaths. Uh, expected uh, to occur in 2023, and a large number of hospitalizations, rehospitalizations, and tremendous economic costs. Now, despite the treatment advances, there are still a large number of eligible patients not receiving one or more of evidence-based guideline recommended truly beneficial therapies, and as a result, are having events that could have been prevented with higher quality care. And as I'll show you greater therapeutic urgency and recognition the risk these patients face, as well as the benefit of therapy is needed and really new approaches and system-based approaches to improve care. So why is this so important? Here's data we've generated from Get With the Guideline Heart Failure. So looking at patients hospitalized with heart failure and looking at their median survival thereafter. And even for those aged 65 to 69 with heart failure, look at their median survival regardless of or irrespective of EF, you know, on the order of 3.3 to four years. Compare that to the median life expectancy of those of similar age, in the US, it's a 15 year or greater loss of median survival. And even for individuals age 90 or above, it's still a four year loss of median survival concomitant with heart failure. So the mortality implications of having heart failure remain profound. And certainly we wanna do what we can to improve upon this very high mortality rate. Now, fortunately, we have a number for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients, those with the F40% or below, a number of therapies that have been developed, tested, and randomized trials, and actually have the power to not just make patients feel better or reduce hospitalizations, but the power to reduce all-cause mortality, extend median survival, give life 
back to these patients. And you can see from the key pivotal randomized clinical trials, the relative risk reduction mortality, you can see the numbers needed to treat and then those amounts standardized to 36 months, you know, in either single or low double digits. And that in addition to the life-saving benefits of these therapies, there are large substantial and additive reductions in the risk of being hospitalized or re-hospitalized with heart failure. So we have a number of evidence-based tools available to us where we can improve outcome if patients are actually treated. So thinking about the time frame of which these therapies became available, you would imagine I'm now going to show you data where in the community, patients with heart failure survival has really been improved by a remarkable amount in this time frame. Well, here's some data, though, looking at one, five, and 10-year mortality rates in a time period that these therapies became widely available and guideline recommended. And although, yes, the trend line shows an improvement, you can see it's really modest. And these mortality rates above 50% at five years. So despite the availability of therapies with clearly established efficacy for reducing morbidity and mortality, the actual rates for patients with heart failure across the communities remain very high. So how do we explain this? Does this mean our therapies really are not working in clinical practice? Well, the short answer is when we look at study after study, setting after setting, the vast majority of patients are actually not receiving the bulk of these therapies. Yes, there's use of ACE inhibitor ARB and beta blockers, but when used, often at lower doses than were studied and shown to be efficacious in randomized clinical trials. We look like therapy MRA, where we've had evidence for two decades, only one third of eligible patients were treated here in the CHAMP HF registry. And this is in the absence of any contraindication or intolerance documented. When we look at therapy like Secubitril Vassar in the timeframe for which this was already FDA approved, already demonstrated reduced mortality, already class one recommend in the guidelines, only 13% of eligible patients. Now, if we ask further, well, how many patients were on triple therapy at recommended target dose, it was shockingly only 1% of these eligible patients. So this explains why in this time frame we've seen so little advance as far as the improvement of survival because the vast majority of patients are not being treated with those therapies and at the doses demonstrate improved clinical outcome. Here's data from the ACC Pinnacle Registry. This is 6 million outpatient heart failure visits cared for by over 8,000 clinicians in 724 practices. And we see exactly the same. Yeah, a little uptick in ACE inhibitor ARB and beta blocker use, but trivial use of MRAs and Secubitril Valsar, even in the time frame where these were class one recommending the guidelines. And we see similar data internationally. So there are large gaps variations, disparities in the use of our guideline-directed medical therapies. So what's the reason behind this? Well, certainly some of this could be gaps in knowledge and awareness of the randomized clinical trial results and what the guidelines say and education may be able to help. But so much more of this is lack of systems that so much determines whether a patient gets on a given medication or not is whether that individual clinician happens to think about it, believes they have enough support and provides that therapy. There are also well-intended in uh, management approaches to where I intend to get this patient started, but therapeutic inertia takes over and uh, insufficient urgency that I'll go through. Now, some of it may be, I know what the trials show, but I just think, you know, they were too narrow. The patient in front of me, they have more comorbid conditions, different vital signs. I don't think this therapy is either going to be safe with them or effective. There can be concerns about side effects and adverse events, questions about safety. 
Some of this may reflect actually overt bias. Oh, the patient's older, I'm sure they wouldn't want this therapy based on their sex or race, ethnicity or socioeconomic status. Oh, I think the medication would be too expensive, not going to necessarily even try, even though it could have potentially been covered for that patient. And legitimate concerns about access, cost, the value of therapy, and really to make a meaningful impact on our use and approach to these therapies, we do need to address these barriers and get them overcome. I wanna highlight inertia. We first uh, really demonstrated this uh, in dramatic fashion with CHAMP HF, where we were looking, showed you the baseline data on the use of guideline-directed medical therapy. But here we're following these patients through outpatient visit after outpatient visit over a 12-month period. And what you can see, the gaps that begin even in the absence of contraindications, even tons of room on their blood pressure, no problem with creatinine, where you see visit after visit after visit where they remain on exactly the same medications, even if there was an intervening hospitalization, even if there's worsening over their symptoms, we don't see appropriate sense of urgency or escalation of therapy. And newer therapy like SGLT2 inhibitor already indicated for diabetes. You have diabetes plus heart failure, ASCVD, only about 2% of the eligible patients being treated. So clinical inertia, therapeutic inertia takes over and patients tend to stay on the same medication, same doses they were on without outpatient up titration initiation or uh, dose changing efforts. So some of this, and we highlighted this in this JAMA editorial of perception of risk. And you know, when we talk about ASCVD, we have the various risk categories and you think about the very highest risk category in the guidelines for ASCVD and compare that to heart failure. That patient that often is viewed as outpatient that hasn't had a recent hospitalization, mild symptoms, somehow gets viewed as if they're low risk. But if we look in objective annual event rate terms compared to the highest risk ASCVD patient, we would be in a category of extreme high risk. And if they've just had a hospitalization for heart failure, very extreme high risk. So there's a misperception of risk. Oh, the patient's seemingly doing well in this outpatient visit, don't need to rock the boat. We can defer any change in therapy or initiation because they're doing really well, stable. What's the worst that could happen? The other thing that I think this reflects in an underlying concept, even though not often spoken of, that many clinicians feel like, well, I got one or two of the evidence-based therapies on board. You know, I'm getting most of the benefit. Adding that third or fourth medication, it's going to be only partially additive, maybe redundant. Are these therapies truly fully additive to each other, where that third medication, fourth medication are offering large and meaningful benefits in both relative and absolute terms, that they're fully additive or maybe even synergistic. And so I think it's important to go through and become convinced and realize and recognize that do we have the compelling evidence these therapies are fully added to each other? What's the magnitude of benefit of the combination of foundational guideline-directed medical therapy? So let's go through that pretty quickly. So back in the day where ACE inhibitors came on board, where it was thought at the time there was not a way a meaningfully improving survival and heart failure was end-stage heart disease, and at best we could palliate these patients. But ACE inhibitor trials compared to placebo added background therapy that was often loop diuretics plus or minus digoxin. And we see that in fact could improve outcome with a reduction in all-cause mortality. So we clearly saw one therapy compared to background and improvement in outcome. Now, our beta blocker trials were done on a high background rate of ACE inhibitor, or ACE inhibitor, or ARB. And what we see in these trials, this incremental survival advantage truly added it. And in fact, the magnitude of relative risk reduction with beta blockers greater than that seen with ACE inhibitor, or ARBs but truly on top of each other. So one plus one equaling two in the magnitude of benefit department from relative and absolute terms. 
Next class of therapy, the MRAs. Now it's true at the time of the Wells trial demonstrating a 30% relative risk reduction mortality was on high background rate of ACE inhibitor ARBs, relatively few beta blocker patients treated because we didn't have the outcome data yet. But when we go to the emphasis HF trial, now beta blockers proven high background rate of use and still see the incremental reduction in all cause mortality. So a cumulative benefit, incremental benefit, adding an MRA clearly improves survival, even if you're already on ACE inhibitor ARB beta blocker at well tolerated target doses. Our next class of therapy was not compared to placebo because it was the combination of neprilysin inhibition with an ARB. So it was compared to the gold standard ACE inhibitor to see if that addition of neprilysin replacing the ACE inhibitor with the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor would have incremental benefit, importantly on a high background rate of use of beta blocker MRA. So truly looking at the incremental benefits of neprilysin inhibition with Secupitril. And what we see is clear reduction, primary endpoint CV death and all cause mortality. So again, incremental cumulative benefits with the addition of this therapy. From a cardiovascular mortality standpoint, we could double up the benefits of either with an ARB or ACE inhibitor alone on the high background MRA use with the neprilysin inhibition combined with the angiotensin receptor inhibition. So clearly a relative and absolute benefit that is clinically meaningful. Now, importantly, across all of these trials, could we pick out a subgroup of patients where, you know what, they're better off not having the therapy added, or in this case, better off remaining on an ACE inhibitor rather than being on Secubitrol Valsartan. And you can see across all these clinically relevant subgroups for the primary composite endpoint for death for CBD, you could not pick out a subgroup where leaving them on an ACE inhibitor or going with an ACE inhibitor instead of the uh, angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor would be a better choice for those patients. A population-wide benefit for heart failure with reduced EF without significant interaction or heterogeneity. Now, our next class of drugs came out of serendipity, the SGLT2 inhibitors originally developed for diabetes therapy for type 2 diabetes, but remarkable findings in the safety studies of showing this very early and very robust reduction in heart failure hospitalizations, new onset heart failure, or those that had heart failure that got in these trials with type 2 diabetes, significant reduction, raising the possibility that these, in fact, agents may have benefits that go beyond their glucose lowering and could, in fact, work in patients without even having type 2 diabetes. And this was then tested in DAPHF, 4,744 patients, heart failure, EF 40% or below, on other standard background therapy, randomized to the SGLT2 and over DAPHICAL flows and versus placebo, irrespective of whether they had type 2 diabetes, over half the patients did not, and primary employing of CV death or hospitalized with heart failure or urgent heart failure visit. And on a high background rate of therapy, you can see this incremental 26% relative risk reduction and in shade of only 21 uh, p-value, highly statistically significant benefits uh, beginning early. You can also see that the benefits were equally large for those with type 2 diabetes and those without type 2 diabetes with no significant interaction whatsoever. We see the benefits, again, across all clinically relevant subgroups, regardless of etiology, race, ethnicity, sex, and so forth. Importantly, we see regardless of whether the EF was above or below the median, whether there was comorbid AFib, whether there was type 2 diabetes or not, regardless of background medical therapy is highlighted here. So whether you're on an MRA or not, you've got that incremental benefit with SGLT2 inverse additive to Secubitril Valsartan. So truly incremental benefit. Also, with regards to safety and tolerability, you can see for those without type 2 diabetes, more patients, um, you know, having uh, events that uh, were uh, serious adverse events, uh, 
you know, with placebo as opposed to dapagliflozin. And things we'd worry about like renal function or hypoglycemia in those without diabetes, you really did not see an increase or euglycemic diabetes, ketoacidosis, not seen in those without diabetes with a very low rate. So benefits clearly outweighing the risk and overall adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation, generally comparable to placebo. Trial was replicated in Emperor Reduce and you can see with the data for all-cause mortality, this class of therapy clearly reduces in an incremental to the other therapies. So we know what we should be providing, but now the question becomes is how we should go about this. And should we just follow the historic sequence in which these therapies were discovered and applied in trials? In which case, you know, We'd start off with the ACE inhibitor ARB up titrate to target dose, and then add the beta blocker, then add aldosterone antagonist, then replace the ACE inhibitor ARB with Secubitril balsartan, and then and only then add the SGLT2 inhibitor, right? We can get these very large benefits. Is that the way we should approach that? But if you actually map this out and see, you know, it would take 28 to 56 weeks to get patients on the full contingent at target dose of guideline-directed medical therapy. So the next question becomes, well, do we have that time? Are these therapies so slowly acting that, you know, taking 28 to 56 weeks to get these therapies initiated would be smart, that it make them safer, better tolerated, more patients treated, and we'd get to the benefits in a clinically relevant time frame. So what's the timing of benefits of these therapies? That really had not been a focus uh, prior to highlighting these kind of algorithms. So let's go through that. So here's data with Carbetalol, Copernicus trial, severe heart failure, beta blocker within two weeks, the survival curves are diverging. The risk of worsened heart failure with just going with ACE inhibitor ARB versus adding the beta blocker in this randomized trial, much more likely to have worsened heart failure over the first eight weeks if just going with your background therapy than adding the beta blocker, you could significantly reduce it. So a very early, a very large magnitude of benefit. What about MRAs? Within about 14 days, this is statistically significant. Within 30 days, highly statistically significant reduction in events on background therapy when starting MRAs. This is Pioneer HF in hospital initiation of enalapro or secubitril valsartan. This isn't weeks, this is days. And you're seeing by day 14, a curve separation through eight weeks, you already have a 42% relative risk reduction, 6% uh, absolute risk reduction. Now think about it, the guidelines of, oh, you could start an ACE inhibitor ARB, and then switch it eight weeks if the patient remains symptomatic. Look at the magnitude of benefit for events that could have been reduced having started first with Secubitril Balsartan. So significant benefits in that regard. And we see in the subgroup of the trial, de novo initiation, better outcomes with starting right off the time of diagnosis, Secubitril Valsartan versus an hour pro and later switching. And similar if the patient had previously had heart failure and was now being hospitalized with worsened heart failure. Now at the end of eight weeks in this trial, it would no longer been ethical to keep the patient on the ACE inhibitor that were already class one in the guidelines. So at that point, everybody who switched to be on Secubitril Valsartan if they were in the now pro arm or continued in the Secubitril Valsartan arm. Did the curves come back together or did you catch up? And you see, no, they continue to be separated. So delaying the initiation of Secubitril Valsartan by just eight weeks, there were preventable events, no catch up, and the patient was worse off. So again, further highlighting this importance of upfront therapy. Now, what about SGLT2 inhibitors? Absolutely remarkable how early the benefits are here. Within a day or two of initiation, you're already seeing clinical benefits, reaching statistical significance at day 28 in DAP-HF. I mean, here the trial ran two, three years, but, you know, could have stopped it at day 28 with your highly statistically significant p-value. You have data within hospital initiation from SOLAS to AHF, where there's benefit within days in the curve separating statistically significant by day 28. You have symptom reduction within four weeks in emperor reduced 
and then impulse a trial of in-hospital initiation, regardless of EF, in the first 24 hours with the SGLT2 inhibitor, there was clinical benefit. So patients feel better, hospitalizations and rehospitalizations being reduced, and mortality reductions early, early. So we proposed and put together this sequence strategy, simultaneous or rapid sequence initiation, released this in 2020, and highlighted the benefits either stable outpatients or hospitalized patients, as long as not in cardiogenic shock or hemodynamically unstable, a low recommended starting dose, simultaneous initiation of the four foundational guideline directed medical therapies. So low dose Secuba 12 valsartan beta blocker MRA and SGLT2, or alternatively in select patients, a rapid sequence strategy where over the next four days, try and get all four therapies initiated. Uh, focus on the titration of beta blockers to get to target dose and then the other medications. And with this compressed strategy, with by about day 21, can be on the full contingent of therapy. The estimated magnitude of benefits over a 75% greater relative risk reduction in the first 30 days. And then beyond this can think, are there additional therapies necessary? Do you need uh, consider device therapy or otherwise? But the prioritization of that complete set of comprehensive disease-modifying medical therapy to be implemented as soon as possible, as well tolerated, a low starting dose simultaneous or very rapid sequence, prioritization, up titration, beta blocker, and then back end of MRA and Secuba 12 SR. And of course, SGLT2 emitters, it's one dose no titration necessary. So what are the benefits of this simultaneous or rapid sequence initiation of these agents? We highlighted here, demonstration of rapid improvement in health status, rapid improvement in LVF, such as many patients that otherwise would have gotten an ICD or CRT device will now have EFs above 35%, no longer necessary or benefit from such therapy, rapid reduction hospitalizations, including within the first 30 days where there are the Medicare penalties, and rapid reduction mortality. But importantly, I'll highlight for you overcoming therapeutic inertia. By getting all four therapies on board, you're not gonna fall into that chasm. And it improves adherence, persistence, and uh, their synergism with regards to tolerability of these meds. So a lot of potential advantages, and I'll show you some data that supports that. So since we first put this out, there have been a number of variations, two by two, other uh, ordering of the different sequences, but all focus on trying to rapidly initiate guideline-directed medical therapy as soon as possible. This actually is a modeling experience, looking at the sequencing of the different drugs or how quickly to initiate and what they end up showing successively, the quicker you get the meds on board, the greater the event reductions versus any delay and the ultimate lowest risk can be achieved with the simultaneous initiation strategy. So here kind of outlines the initiation and up titration sequence the magnitude of early mortality reduction that can be achieved with each of these classes, and that, in fact, they're truly additive to each other. Now, you may be thinking that's well and good, but, you know, let's get real here. Many of my patients may have lower blood pressure, can start these four medications, even though at lower dose, you're going to see them get markedly hypotensive. This is going to fail immediately. But, of course, it didn't, because the reality is when, yes, you're hypertensive, these medications lower blood pressure. But when you're normal tensive, the changes are very low. And if the blood pressure is actually on the borderline side, there's a breaking function. You don't get a decrease in anything in Copernicus. Those with systolic blood pressure is 85 to 95 had increase in blood pressure as you're rapidly improving LV function. Uh, in MRA, you see very little change if that blood pressure is on the lower side, though large reductions if blood pressure is very high. And same thing with SGLT2 inhibitors. So Cubitrol Sudden, you can see a little uptick in symptomatic hypotension. You can adjust the diuretic and usually get around this. But most patients will actually be able to tolerate well. And if you look at hospitalized heart failure patients, first 24 hours, you know, the median systolic blood pressure in the U.S. is about 140. So, you know, if anything, they need additional blood pressure control. It's only about 
two to 5% of patients with cyst valve blood pressure, 90 or below. Clearly at transplant centers transferred in, it's a different patient population, but all comers being hospitalized with heart failure in that regard. The other thing I want to highlight, and we published this in Jack Heart Failure, was yes, you'll see adverse events after starting these medications, but you'll see adverse events even if you don't start the medications or start placebo. So here are the randomized clinical trials, and you know, there are adverse events that occur that get attributed to study drug when that study drug is placebo. So it's the underlying disease, and looking at the rates you actually see that for many, our individual medications are comparable to placebo for inverse event rates or even lower, right? Especially if it includes heart failure as an inverse event. So we don't see discontinuation differences, but we certainly do see where patient got started on placebo, physician thinks, oh, I caused an adverse event with this medication, making changes. So we really need to think long and hard, is it the matter or is it the underlying condition? Can I manage this patient through it so they can receive those benefits? Now, you may say, yeah, the trials, they're younger patients. I don't think they're representative. But look more closely at the recent trials on these classes of drugs where there are 40, 50% of the patients age 65 and older and up to a third or a quarter that are age 75 and above. And those patients derive benefits from relative terms as large, but because they're at higher absolute risk, even greater absolute benefit, and the safety and tolerability was reasonable and good. So we actually have data that the benefits greatly outweigh the risk, even in much older patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Certainly, we want to individualize therapy to be aligned with patients' goals, preference, and wishes. But for those patients where we're aiming to make them feel better, keep them out of the hospital, live longer, even if older, these patients derive significant benefit. You say, well, in the trials, they don't have as much comorbid condition. It may be true, but they certainly have many. Do we have any real-world clinical practice data about safety and efficacy? In fact, for all these classes, we do. Here's data we've generated with get with guideline heart failure and looking at real-world clinical effectiveness. You can see the median ages here in the 79-80 range for beta blocker, for secubitrol balsam, for MRA. Survival benefits every bit as large as we saw in the clinical trials in the real world practice, but because these are higher risk patients, the absolute mortality reductions are even larger. And so safety, tolerability, real world clinical effectiveness. Now, what about rising creatinine? You start these medications, some patients drop in GFR, rising creatinine. Well, you know, none of these medications are nephrotoxic. These are renally protective therapies or neutral. Now, you can see these drops in creatinine, rising GF, or uh, drop in GFR and rising creatinine. And we would call that right if it goes up by 0.3 milligrams per decimal. Acute kidney injury. Who wants to cause acute kidney injury in our patients? But in fact, if you look at the overall trajectory, these drops in GFR are expected. They're well tolerated and overall end up with better renal function in the longer term. And here, looking in DAP HF, when you had a drop in renal function on placebo, well, that wasn't good. But when it was in response to the SGLT2 inhibitor, you actually had better clinical outcomes, you know, drugs there are working. So intrarenal hemodynamics should not defer you here. You're not causing renal toxicity. These patients benefit from therapy and the maintenance is critically important. We have empiric data that supports that. Patients who in the absence of contraindications are having their neurohormonal antagonists withdrawn, they have a much higher event rate than those who are continued or newly started. So there are consequences of withholding medications for patients. Now you can say, you know, that's great, the individual therapies and you're showing on the background, but you know, do we really have a study where you know, rapid simultaneous or near simultaneous initiation during the hospitalization and then intense up titration of multiple therapies at once is truly safe, all tolerate improved outcomes. And in fact, we now do, and that's with strong HF. So these are patients hospitalized with heart failure that basically have um, whatever background medical therapy was um, and were 
put on guideline-directed therapy, a focus on triple therapy, started in hospital and with up titration in hospital to where by the time of hospital discharge, going home on at least 50% of target dose. And so these patients were then followed up weekly for a very brief period to where there was further optimization. And by week two or three, aiming to have the full contingent of guideline-directed medical therapy at the time, so triple therapy, and then followed through 90 days and 180 days for clinical outcomes as well as safety. Trial stopped early due to benefit. And what you can see compared to usual care, what we kind of talked about, if you didn't focus on getting these therapies started in hospital by day 90, day 180, a lot of patients not on therapy. In the high intensity care arm, however, shown in red, you see much higher rates of being on either half dose or full dose with regards to these uh, patients. You know, So really substantial differences in use of therapy by this intensive strategy approach. So what did that mean in safety tolerability? Well, did we bag the kidneys with this approach? No. Well, tolerate hyperkalemia to some extreme degree, very little change there. Some lowering the blood pressure, but overall not much. And New York heart class significantly improving, BMP improving. And importantly for clinical outcomes, this 34% relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction quite large and 180 day readmission for heart failure all cause death, a risk difference of 8.1 and statistically significant. If we look at quality of life using EQ5D, we see significant benefit as well. So here's some tips for optimal titration of guideline-directed medical therapy. You can stagger the dose during the day, recognize the rise in creatinine, attempt to distinguish symptoms that represent heart failure or comorbidities versus actual medication side effects. Emphasize to the patients the benefits of adherence and cost. Break that barrier of, oh, each successive med means I'm getting worse and I'm sicker, rather than, no, this is polypharmacy that's truly beneficial. These meds in combination are going to help markedly improve your clinical outcome so that each therapy is improving heart function and prognosis, not an indicator of patients getting worse. So here's um, from an editorial Steve Green and I wrote in European Journal of Heart Failure. And we're needing to highlight how so much of our focus is avoiding you know, the risk of commissions. Like the last thing we would want to do is cause a side effect or reverse event to our patient. But we're perfectly willing to accept the potential harms of not trying guideline-directed medical therapy that we know will decrease survival, increase hospitalization, worsen quality of life, and increase symptoms. Because somehow not starting the therapy and having a bad outcome, we can write that off as a natural history rather than our result of omission, which is a true action. So in every setting, there's the opportunity to overcome this clinical inertia, recognize the risks the patients face, recognize the benefits of combination therapy or titration of such therapy, and overcome this inertia and provide benefit. And we highlighted it further in this uh, recent Jack editorial of really uh, showing what the risk of lack of initiation, titration, or persistence for each of these classes of therapy. And so really we need to move from this fear of you know, adverse events and intolerance towards the fear of not starting one or more of these therapies and the adverse outcomes these patients face. So the magnitude of benefits here, this is highlighting you know, the absolute and relative risk reductions in all-cause mortality for hospitalizations, you know, a 33% absolute risk reduction, 85% relative risk reduction. So they're really profound, overcoming inertia, overcoming the system's barriers, critically important. Now, if you look at the guidelines and management pathways, they have now embraced this approach of recommending all the class one recommended therapies, ESC guidelines, start and focus on the foundational therapies that reduce mortality in all patients, start them as soon as possible and as well tolerated. Class one level of evidence A, 2022, 
ACCHA, HFSA guidelines that focus on foundational therapy. There's firm recommendation to start with Secubitril Valsartan first, preferred over ACE inhibitor ARB, evidence-based beta blocker, MRA, SGLT2 inhibitor with an algorithm where they can be started simultaneously or in rapid sequence. The guidelines do have the recommendations for additional therapy that can be added on, but the focus on the foundational quadruple therapies. Now, to further highlight and why are we emphasizing, you know, do I really need to get these therapies started in the hospital? Why can't I wait till that first visit after discharge start then? Well, here's data from Connect HF, where the focus was after hospital discharge with intensive kind of quality improvement efforts, got volunteer hospitals, volunteer patients. And yet when we look from the time of hospital discharge to 12 month follow-up, the net median change in use and dosing of guideline-directed medical therapy at the hospital level was zero. Let me say that again, zero net change once that patient was discharged. And you can look at the high rates for adverse outcomes. So we really need to view hospitalization as a teachable moment, get as much of our GDMT on board and recognize going to outpatient under usual care or even with this quality improvement program wasn't enough. We need stronger outpatient disease management programs. We'll go through, but clearly more needs to be done here. So in hospital initiation versus post-discharge initiation at clinician discretion, study after study shows that for not discharge on therapy, unlikely to be treated as an outpatient and unlikely then to derive the benefits. So in hospital initiation has a host of benefits as listed here. And unfortunately in heart failure, go slow means rarely initiate. The guidelines of embraces now have a class one recommendation for early initiation of GDMT during hospitalization. Other strategies for facilitating GDMT initiation, talked about all four classes at time of diagnosis and hospital initiation, performance improvement programs like go with the guidelines, multidisciplinary disease management programs, navigators focused on initiation and titration of GDMT, focused clinics, telehealth, digital health tools, or actually going to the patient directly, educating them and asking them to go to the clinician to get them activated, the epic HF approach. We have data from hundreds of hospitals and tens of thousands of clinicians. You can meaningfully improve the use of these therapies with quality improvement programs. This data from Prompt HF, where nudging clinicians um, with the EHR can also lead to some improvements. So we really can have an important impact. For heart failure with mildly reduced preserved DF, we now have therapies there that can improve Seems like we're having a small issue. Just hold with us for a second. We're back. I think you're muted now. You should, you're you muted still, Dr. Fonaro. Perfect. Steve, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for getting me back on quick. I appreciate it. So sorry about the technical glitch. So highlighting here that that quadruple therapy approach can extend to mildly reduced and some of the preserved EF patients, SGLT2 inhibitors across the board, regardless of EF. So finally, to kind of put this in context, one of the other big issues is cost. And so what's the cost and value of these therapies, right? Because some of these are branded medications. And so it's a legitimate question. Is it worth the time, cost, expense to use these therapies? And that's entirely legitimate. Now, when we look at formal cost effectiveness analysis, as we published here in Jack Heart Failure, you know, the cost per quality of life save good, high value, you know, 
45, $50,000. That's great. But, you know, the patient, what they see is their out of pocket expense. We also looked at intensive guideline directed medical therapy programs. They're highly effective, you know, $5,000 per quality adjusted life save. But of course, for the patient and their out of pocket expense, what does this mean as far as extending life? And so here's data published with Muthu, Valka, Nathan, and Lancet. Where we looked at this, you know, not just the additive relative risk reduction, but the cumulative benefit in extending median survival. Compared not to nothing, but being on an ACE inhibitor ARB and beta blocker, is that sufficient? Or do we really need quadruple therapy? And what this shows is that quadruple therapy compared to double therapy, you can extend median survival by 6.3 years. Contrast that to oncology. If you have a chemotherapeutic regimen that extends median survival by three months, it's touted as a phenomenal breakthrough. Charge 200, 300,000 a year for that regimen. Nobody bats an eye. Here we have a condition with far greater lethality and you know, extending survival 10, 20 fold at dramatically lower costs. So you know, the value is clearly there. Um, need to overcome whatever barriers patients find in obtaining these meds. Do we have evidence that greater use of GDMT in clinical practice translates to mortality reduction from improved HF, every 10% improvement in guideline concordant care, 13% lower risk of 24-month mortality, translating guidelines into practice, utilizing GDMT in our real-world patients improve outcome. So, our clinical trials have shown over the last 20 years dramatic improvements in outcomes. In the community where patients are getting care by whatever the clinician decides, we've not seen that same improvement in our heart failure reduced EF patients. Why? Clinical trials to enroll the patient by protocol, you must be on standardized guideline directed medical therapy at the time and then study drug on top of it. So, if we have that systematic approach, we could markedly improve outcomes. So, number needed to treat here to save a life, unbelievably low four. Now, do we need further research to further reduce mortality? Yes, but. This type of data makes it compelling. We should make every effort to get for our eligible patients without contraindications, guideline-directed medical therapy initiated and maintained. If we can pull this off at population level, just the big four therapies, we could save an estimated incremental 96,000 additional lives a year. Now, you know, there's a huge push by the government to make sure everybody with hep C gets treated. And they estimate, wow, you know, 14,000 lives a year could be saved with that, even though, you know, costs tens of billions of dollars worth it. And, you know, a big push to make that happen. But if we could achieve this for our heart failure patient population, far lower costs, phenomenal number of lives can be saved. Why? Because these patients are such high risk for any mortality rates. So compelling population health benefits. So to summarize the approach to heart failure reduced EF meds, the benefits of these meds are truly additive and incremental. No substantial overlaps, never been demonstrated in any of these four therapies. The outcome improvements that we see with these therapies are clinically meaningful and relevant. The optimal approach to utilize these meds is to get those therapies that reduce all-cause mortality started as soon as possible, ideally in combination, so long as not contraindicated or not well-tolerated, start each without delay. A serial or selective approach that's been used traditionally, unfortunately, leads to delays and heart failure hospitalizations and deaths that could have been prevented with earlier use. And importantly, these drugs provide high economic, but most importantly, meaningful clinical value for our patients, such that whatever barriers exist, we need to find effective strategies to overcome them to make sure that equitably all of our eligible patients that could benefit from the therapies are receiving them, receiving them at the right and well-tolerated dose so that they can derive the benefit and we can markedly reduce further the morbidity mortality of heart failure. Thank you so much for your attention today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Cornero. That was an outstanding, uh, outstanding lecture, so important for patients. 
And so pleased for everyone, we had a very high uh, audience and number of, of people joining. So please put the questions in the Q&A, we'll go through them. Uh, if uh, I'll start with the first question. We were chatting briefly before about both in heart failure and ASCVD, uh, and you, you touch base on your lecture that we can depend on, on our patients following with the individual cardiologists and with cardiologists or physicians that are up to date with all these changes. Uh, how do we, as as networks, as hospital networks, how we how do we approach this? Do we need pharmacies prescribing? Do we need NPs with protocols? What do you, what do you think? Did we lose him? I think we're having some minor issues with the. Uh, there we go. I think you're muted now. If you want to unmute. Great. Perfect. Yep, sorry about that much again. No, no problem. So I was just touching base on both for heart failure and, and, and ACVD. We can depend on each individual, each physician to see the patients, to up titrate. How do we approach these as organizations, as, as healthcare networks? Yeah, there's emerging data that really uh, shows us that protocol driven and with clinician oversight that firm D's advanced practice nurses navigators are able to actually initiate and up titrate these therapies and most patients some may need a little assistance so that we can really think of a system approach work together as a team and the routine kind of up titration and adjustment in the straightforward patient can take place without the cardiologist having to be directly involved in there just as backup for questions. There are some randomized trials of telephone-based nurse up titration of meds that's gone very well. Their navigator program, some of them have not been randomized, but show large proportion of patients getting to optimal therapy. And so using these kind of extended approaches, you know, certainly from a prioritization standpoint, and we're not talking like, oh, patients need to be seen every week for the next five years. Years. We're talking about a few, you know, visits that could be telehealth or with the physician extender in that standpoint where the majority of patients will be able to up titrate. That's scalable, that's sustainable, and can be definitely done in, you know, almost every system and, and regardless of the resource environment. And, and some of this we can bring directly to the patient's home with telehealth visits. And, you know, maybe we need to evaluate even patients given the algorithm and they got their own up titration and then seek out us, and, you know, and have some home testing and monitoring of their potassium levels and, and have it almost, uh, you know, self-management. Yeah, I love that. Empowering our patients also to know about their condition. And it's essential. I, I agree. So we have a question from our chief, Mario Garcia. He says, I am surprised about your slide showing no change in community survival over the last two decades. Could that be partially uh, could that partially be attributed to increased age in more recent cohorts? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, right? It's really perplexing, right? In some ways depressing if you're dedicated the last 20 years to, to try and improve outcomes for heart failure. So the you know, risk adjustment is taking place. There may be changes in the way, you know, comorbidities are documented and those other aspects. But, you know, this has shown up in a number of data sets. So this is data we see in Framingham, uh, Olmstead County. When we look at patients, um, you know, in fee-for-service Medicare, you know, there have been declines going on from about, you know, the 1990s to about 2010, and then things kind of flattened out from them or even a little bit of an uptick. So it's a little perplexing on that component where we've made such gains, say, post-MI survival and in other settings, but so much of it, the gaps in therapy. So, you know, you did see ACE inhibitors, beta blockers kind of get on board to a certain degree, but then sort of stall out. And some of the MRAs, you know, in Europe, you have seen some improvements over time, but there's much higher uptake of MRAs in Europe, 70, 80, 90%, whereas US has been much lower out of this fear of causing hyperkalemia um, in the monitoring and system. So, you know, a number of data sets have shown it. We'd like to think of maybe now. That said, there are 
in advanced, you know, heart failure management programs where there have been intense attempts of applying guideline directed medical therapy. And, you know, over 20 years at UCLA, we've shown successive improvements in outcomes. So, you know, there are examples where you, when you do apply the therapy, you see the improved outcome. And that's why I highlighted in the clinical trial placebo arms over a 20 year period, outcomes of those enrolled in trials have improved, um, you know, so again, it's highlighted, it's not like, oh, it's the underlying condition can't be changed. It's that we're not applying these therapies. But when we do, the outcomes improve the way we expect they would. We have a related question from Omar Saeed, a heart failure cardiologist with us. Great talk. How do you separate heart failure mortality in patients with severely reduced LVF and low blood pressure from underuse of GDMT versus late recognition of advanced heart failure? Yeah, you know, this is a great question and really important and, and don't want to at all diminish that there are certain patients where at the time they're presenting to the clinician who recognizes what's going on, they're, they're advanced and what they need, GDMT simultaneous or any which way isn't going to solve that problem. They're low output. They need to get to the advanced therapy program. They need to be referred. Those who don't tolerate GDMT, that's a bad sign. They need to get referred. So there are certain patients where mechanical support is going to be needed, transplantation, no question. But there are also some where, you know, the blood pressure is lower, their output's lower, their SVR is high, and we could get these meds on board and actually do pretty well. And it's this paradox you have to get over. Lower blood pressure, there's a higher risk of mortality, but you start these therapies and you actually see blood pressure either stay the same or go up and mortality risk goes down. So they're deriving this greater benefit, but it's this whole you know, limitation around why am I giving a blood pressure lowering medication to a patient with heart failure's blood pressures already on the lower side. It's hard to conceptualize that. You put it in, oh, it's a neurohormonal antagonist, but still it ends up leaving a lot of patients on lower dose than they could have actually tolerated. And as you're up titrating the meds, blood pressure is going up and you actually have some of these patients where you expose this underlying hypertension where you know their EF was 20, their blood pressure was 85, 90, and now you know EF's back up 40, 45 on their combination therapy, and their blood pressure is 140, 150, or max their foundational meds, and you're asking, when am I going to add on top of this? So it's really important though, recognizing those patients that are low output, um, those patients that really need advanced therapy early, that's important. Intolerance of GDMT, any of the classes of drugs is, is a prognostic warning sign that should get them to a multidisciplinary heart failure program as well. So really key point in question, which I appreciate. Thank you very much. We have a, one, I think, common uh, theme between some questions. So we see a patient in the clinic uh, and some of our patients we know may have low health literacy or may be concerned about starting all these medications together, or they may have to wait for three to six months for, for the next appointment in certain systems. Uh, how do we solve this? Is a polypeel possible? Yeah, so, you know, for some of the patients, we'll, we'll give them the prescription for all of the meds, but then start them in a staggered fashion by the design we're laying out that, you know, for two days with this med, then two days later, already well, than the second med and third, you know, so address, meeting them where they're at, addressing their concerns, coming up with a plan, using telephone follow-up, pre-order the labs that we want, get them assured. And the discussion is really about this aspect, but I'll tell you something, when you're up front, here are the four meds you're gonna be on, let's get them started. Here are the benefits, here's the time course. It takes away the long discussion of, you know, two months later, oh, I have another med to add. And they're like, why do I need this med now? I'm feeling pretty good. You go, oh no, well, you know, enhance your survival. Well, you know, if it was so good, why didn't you start it two months ago? You're just, I'm getting worse. The meds you gave me before aren't working fully. There's this extra med, why do I need that? And, you know, and then they're often more inclined to either not start it or stop it. So, you know, there's something that's communicated about upfront this foundation of meds you need to be on. It's no one pill is going to magically solve this. And once we get your EF up to normal, we're going to be continuing them because 
this is a long-term issue with you, but we can achieve, you know, you can argue about what the term should be a reversal, remission, a prolonged um, improvement in your EF, but you can truly change the natural history for this patient over years and decades with getting these therapies on board. Thank you very much. We have a few questions from, from fellows just as common scenarios they see when a patient gets admitted with heart failure and they, there's acute kidney injury, do you usually continue your ASAR of ARNI uh, or you st on MRA, MRA or you stop them? What should they do? Yeah, so we need to, you know, acute kidney injury, these rises in creatinine, and they're not injury to the kidney, they're intrarenal hemodynamics. And in many cases, it's the patient's over diarrhea. So what we're carefully doing and looking at their volume status and often backing off in their diuretic, or in some cases, upping their, their dietary sodium intake and making that as the first change. Unless, you know, we're checking orthostatics, we're looking at their, their blood pressure in that standpoint. Have we made them, you know, too hypotensive? So first is adjusting the volume status in that standpoint. There can be some adjustments in dosing. We tend to not want to stop one or more of the medications. Now, with somebody scratching the one and is now four, that, that's a different story. And we're obviously going to try and figure out what happened there. Did they get NSAIDs? What's causing, you know, what is overt renal failure? But these modest increases in cramming declines 15, 20, 30 percent in GFR, even when pretty far down the road, you know, with a GFR that's 40 and it's now at 30. I, you know, these are renally protective drugs. You have chronic kidney disease without heart failure. Each of these are indicated as renally protective. Um, other than the beta blocker, which is neutral. So, you know, it's really that these are not causing kidney injury, they're kidney protective, and we just need to get their hemodynamics and intrarenal hemodynamics stabilized and right. And we can usually make adjustments and don't generally need to hold the medications, may need to do some temporary dose adjustments. Thank you very much. A question here on when, they, when you have titrate the GDMT and then the patient stops one of the medications, are we all back to square square one? You know, it depends, right? So if it's MRA and they tolerate it well without hyperkalemia and they stop, you know, their 25 of spironolactone, you can often restart at that dose, just monitor their potassium. For the beta blocker, if they've been off for, you know, not just a day or two and really off, then you can do, you should start at lower dose and up titrate, but you can customize that. There's nothing magical at one to two weeks. Some of these patients, if room on their blood pressure, you can go up more quickly. Um, and same thing with Sucubitrol Valsartan of taking that, you know, prior information where the blood pressure is at, but shouldn't just like somebody who's been off all their meds for a month, low EF, you know, just go right on back to the full doses they were on. You do need to reinitiate, but can do a more compressed kind of up titration. Thank you very much. A question from Daniel Lorenzati, amazing lecturer. Thank you. The data from strong HF is truly compel compelling. Do you think that this high intensity care with several and frequent visits post discharge could be translated right away into real clinical practice considering the human resources available? You know, it's so it's if we step back and think for a moment that right, it's kind of amazing because here, you know, done in, in medium and low resource countries and patients seem back. And here we are with all our sophisticated medical equipment and testing and genotyping and precision medicine. And we're saying, you know, the really high tech, unbelievable difficult thing to do is see a patient back within a week. So, you know, our health systems need to be realigned about what really matters here. Again, it doesn't need to be the advanced heart failure specialist. It can be allied health, but we should put those systems into place to where patients, whether virtually or in person can be seen back to where, you know, for somebody who faces a 50% event rate in the next 90 days of being rehospitalized or dying, you think we could put together the resources to have, you know, weekly visits for two or three weeks to be able to get them back with somebody um, to get them on these meds uh, that can have such dramatic improvement in their outcome. It's not like we're saying we need a weekly, you know, PET scan or cardiac MRI. Um, so I, th this should be feasible if there, there's the will. And that's 
part of it is recognizing that urgency. I mean, you look at chemotherapeutic regimens, some of these patients go under and the resources required and the feedback or somebody coming in for radiation therapy where they're coming in five days a week successively for you know eight weeks, that can be done, including their transport. But we're seeing that same health system can engender to get a patient back, you know, three weeks in a row for one, you know, visit. So I think we need to just reorient the priorities and this kind of magnitude of benefits profound, the economic value, in part why we put out the cost effectiveness analysis of the strong HF model to kind of illustrate, you know, the magnitude of clinical benefit, but also this phenomenal cost effectiveness. Thank you very much. Uh, as a last question we have from our fellows, uh, what about hyperkalemia? When, when our patients develop hyperkalemia, should we be using K binders? Yeah, it's a great question and, and they are available and, and there's evidence that they can attenuate the potassium increases or allows to treat. I think, you know, the, the debate to me is compared to not treating the magnitude of benefit is so great with treatment. So somebody can't get on any dose. SGLT2 interviews facilitate MRA, so need to make sure there's not the potassium diet. But if you've done those things to get them on the drug um, or be able to keep them on, yes. The issue of trying to up titrate, you know, go from 12.5 to 25 as spironolactone, is that worth a potassium binder? There, you know, we don't have enough data on the dose response. There's some costs to these and challenges. They may block some of the absorption of other things as sodium load. So there's, I, I think there's some equipose and we need some further clinical trial data. But rather than a choice of just not beyond the MRA, that is not a good a choice. I mean, the mortality benefits we're leaving on the table. So in those patients to be able to treat, yeah, to at least medium dose, uh, totally worthwhile, and we do that in practice for sure. Do you? And there's a so last question, so right. I go through all the questions. Otherwise, people complain. So the 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 question of Corec versus metoprolol to allow for up titration of the other medications. Any preference? Yeah, great question. So um, it's it's a little tricky. So the guidelines, you know, long-acting metropolol or carvedilol, target dose 25 BID, carvedilol, long-acting metropolol, succinate 200 milligrams, target dose. The blood pressure reductions, even though you think, oh, there's the alpha blockade with carvedilol early on, are less than with metropolol. Blood pressure goes up. Why? Your vasodilating a little bit more carb blood flow. So it's actually easier and wedge falls, metropolol goes up a little bit easier and earlier benefit with carvedilol than metropolol. Now it eventually equalizes, catches up, and you could argue between which one you like. So either one, but there's not a huge advantage. Same thing in COPD. So we've just tended to favor carvedilol, but metropolol succinates fine, but it does not allow you to get more patients on board. What we do see though, is when metropolol succinates use, people get parked on lower dose 50 or 100 and stop there. So rare you see people up titrated to 200, whereas that was the dose in Merit HF, the median dose was 159. So if you're parking the person on 50 or 100 versus you know, 25 BID of carvedilol, you're leaving benefit on the table. And we know metropolol tartrate you know, at 50 BID versus carvedilol, 25 BID, that was, you know, 1.4 years difference in median survival in the Comet trial. So, you know, it matters getting to the target dose of beta blocker for EF improvement, hospitalization reduction, and mortality reduction. So really important that we use one of the evidence-based beta blockers to target dose so long as well tolerated. If you don't tolerate one, switch to the other. Thank you very much. I, I guess we can end there. That was outstanding. And I'm sure we'll use this to distribute all this knowledge to, to the network and, and hopefully more hospitals as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.